seem to be clicking, not speaking. Yeah, I hear that too. Is that a headset you're using? Yeah, I don't know what's going on for those of you out in the audience. Uh, we tested it earlier and everything was fine. Mr. Peters, could you please leave and come back in? Sound check and everything was working before. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's all good. Okay, very good. You'd think by now um, we'd be able to work out all these technical difficulties, but I'm sure it's probably on my end. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your patience, and thank you for joining us for the final Smart Growth Subcabinet Panel Forum of the Hogan-Rutherford Administration. I'm Wendy Peters, and I'm pleased to serve as the Special Secretary of Smart Growth. I'm also pleased to be joined today by representatives from each of the agencies that comprise the subcabinet. And as always, we're grateful for their good work and their collaboration. Now, we've been doing these go-to webinars for quite some time, but wanna orient you a little bit. Chuck, if you'll advance to the next um, slide. If you have a question, of course, um, submitted at any time using the questions tool in the control panel located on the right side of your screen. After each presentation, there'll be a short Q&A to answer any questions. Please submit your questions or comments using the questions tool on the control bar. We'll get as many questions as possible. And now we're gonna to, to go into the Chuck Boyd special, our poll questions. We'd like to get a feel for where our attendees are located. Central Maryland, Capital, Upper or Lower Eastern Shore, Southern or Western Maryland. Identify your planning region and Chuck will give us the results. How are we doing, Chuck? We're, we're collecting, uh, still collecting uh, responses and getting a few, and we'll be closing just momentarily. Great. We'll close this now. And so the results are 61% uh, from Central Maryland, 15% to Upper and Eastern Shore, 11% from Southern Maryland. 8% uh, from the Capital Region, and 6% from uh, Western Maryland. Now Great. we can go to our next question, next poll Great. question. Next poll question. Which of the following best describes your role when it comes to smart and sustainable growth? Or we need to advance the screen to poll question number two. Elected official, local planning department, state agency official, private and nonprofit organization, or general public? And we're collecting responses right now. We'll give them another 30 seconds or so to everyone respond. A few more seconds and we'll... Uh... I can close it now, it looks like. And the results are 32% uh, local planning, 31% uh, from state agencies, 19% uh, from the general public, 13% from the private nonprofit organization group, and 4% from the elected officials. 
Thank you very much for taking the poll questions. Right, and no matter where you're from or what your role is, we're grateful to have worked with you all these years, and we're grateful to have you as part of this public forum. As you know, under Governor Hogan's leadership, we've been more accessible and responsive to our citizens and to our local governments, and that really is, has been across the entire state. We've been committed to working together to preserve our abundant environmental assets, while really also providing resources to support a strong economy across the entire state. Working together with all of the agencies in this sub cabinet and working with all of you over the past eight years, we've been able to bring real and lasting change to Maryland. We've shown that with a strong partnership between state government and our local leaders, all of us working together, we can get things done. We can solve some of the really tough problems and we can ensure that together we have changed Maryland for the better. I would like to give a big thanks to all of our local government partners um, and certainly to the staff of the Department of Planning as well, especially uh, Chuck Boyd and John Coleman uh, for being, being able to put these things together so we can communicate and have a real opportunity for dialogue and, and assist our local partners. With that, I'm going to be turning over um, the moderating of this session to Chuck Boyd, and we're going to be hearing from the agencies to really look at what the accomplishments have been changing Maryland for the better, and those are indeed accomplishments by the numbers. Chuck? Thank you, uh, Special Secretary Peters. Uh, for the first agency, um, um, uh, Kristen uh, Fleckenstein from the Maryland Department of Planning. Uh, John will unmute uh, Kristen and uh, we'll hear from her. Thank you. John, you wanna un unmute? Kristen, you are unmuted. Yep, I just did it myself. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Secretary Peters and, and everyone on this call and this webinar um, for everything that you've done in the last um, in the last eight years for, for Maryland. Department of Planning is really, really proud of a lot of our accomplishments. And, and one of those that we're most proud of is the Maryland's is Maryland's response to the 2020 census as it was really a large accomplishment for us. In 2020, more than 2.2 million Maryland households were counted, representing a total enumeration of 99.9%. And that left us ranked at ninth in the nation with a self for self-response. So why is that important? Because there are approximately $1.5 trillion allocated to state and local governments based on its data for use for, for more than 180 federal programs that are funded using census data. And that includes things like Medicaid, Head Start, emergency services, school construction, highway and transportation projects, housing assistance, education, and other matters. And so because of that, we receive about $16 billion in census-derived federal funding. And it's not just regard to representation in Congress and, and the state legislature. Census data is used to support decision-making for economic development, transportation, economic, uh, emergency management, and public health and human services activities. It's estimated that each person who doesn't complete the census represents about $1,850 per year in missed federal funding. Over a 10 year period, that's almost $20,000 per Marylander that we would be out. So we're really proud of getting all of those Maryland households to respond as they did. Also in 2019, planning delivered to Governor Hogan a new state development plan, a better Maryland and the accompanying website, abetter.maryland.gov. The plan is a culmination of two years of outreach, engagement, partnerships, and collaboration. And development of the plan involved extensive coordination, including more than 90 meetings with local government officials, planning and economic development staff, as well as the public. It also included an online survey with consultation with numerous committees and state agencies. 
The plan supports collaboration among state and local governments and other stakeholders providing resources and tools for the long-term economic success of Maryland. The Digital Resource Center is a one-stop shop, a one-stop connection between state agency and state agency policies and programs and information resources for all Marylanders. Through planning services, planning typically completes more than 200 technical assistance projects for counties and municipalities every year. The department provides support in reviewing and drafting dozens of comprehensive plans and ordinances for local governments. We also collect, analyze, and publish social, economic, and geographic information and maintain the digital maps of the state's 2.3 million parcels. These maps form the foundation for a development of policies used by various agencies, decision makers, and stakeholders. We also ensure that proposed financial and non-financial assistance projects within Maryland are consistent with state and local laws, regulations, and guidelines. And working with communities throughout the state on projects that better serve Marylanders is, is important to us, but we also play a critical role in revitalizing communities through the Maryland Historical Trust and the work they do. Over 1,500 historic revitalization projects, totaling nearly 90 million, were funded over the last eight years. That includes over 50 large commercial projects, totaling over $71 million, and nearly 150 small commercial projects, totaling $5 million. So as you can see, we've been busy and we're proud to be able to offer all of those services to Maryland and also very proud to be hosting these webinars. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Kristen. And for next will be Michelle Cable from the Maryland Department of the Agriculture. Hello, thank you for having this uh, meeting today and learning what we've all accomplished over these last eight years. Um, for the Department of Agriculture, I'd like to highlight a few of the programs here. Uh, the first one, the Maryland Agricultural Land Preservation Foundation. Um, and over these last eight years, the funding for the MOUTH program um, increased more than fourfold. When taking office in FY15, the funding went from 15 million to this past uh, full cycle in fiscal year 22, and actually that's a typo, sorry, 23, it was $73 million. And in that time period, protected more than 55,000 acres of land. So there's permanently protected farmland added to the total for the entire program is over 350,000 acres for the state. Um, in that time frame, uh, we spent over 227 million on this for this these 55,000 acres. Um, and for the life of the program since the 70s, it is 885 million. So there's been a lot of work toward farmland preservation. Um, in the Office of Resource Conservation, over these last eight years, there's been investment of over $273 million um, on agricultural land that went toward meeting the state's water quality goals. Um, this includes the implementation of the Maryland uh, Phosphorus Management Tool Regulation, uh, which set trans tra manure transport records every year since 2015. It helped farmers plant over three and a half million acres of cover crops um, and also included a new Maryland Healthy Soils program and rolled over 8,000 acres in there. Um, in total, all of these practices prevented 25 million pounds of nitrogen and 460,000 pounds of phosphorus from reaching the Chesapeake Bay to improve the water quality. And part of that success really was on the back of um, new positions were made to help the farmers be out in the counties, out in the places where they were. So over 53 new positions were created to help install these practices. Um, and so that's just a, a small snapshot by the numbers of what MDA has done over these last eight years. Thank you very much, Michelle, and appreciate that. Um, just for uh, those that are listening to us, uh, we welcome any questions uh, you have. Put Please put them in the, the question box, and uh, we'll collect those. And at the end, uh, I will go through those and try to direct them to the appropriate agency. So feel free to, to uh, put those questions in there. And for the next 
uh, uh, um, agency up uh, is uh, Christina Parati from the Maryland, uh, the Department of Biz, Bu, Bid, uh, Budget and Management. Thank you. Christine. Christine. Hi, everyone. Um, so, of course, DBM puts together the state's capital and operating budgets. Um, and most of our funding related to smart growth flows through the, the capital budget. Um, so our capital budgets over the administration total nearly $19 billion. Um, and of course, we make sure that we get funding in the budget that you all need to implement your programs, such as the MELP, because um, you all are doing the real work. And also many of our projects go through the smart growth conservation and criteria review process. Um, and uh, other, others are funded through programs that consider smart growth policy in the project selection process. Um, we review projects and sometimes our questions that we ask agencies submitting these projects uh, have to do with the smart growth criteria and how we make sure we are addressing certain criteria with these projects. Um, and you know, a lot of these projects that again, the agencies themselves implement uh, are uh, taken, the smart growth criteria are taken into consideration. Um, and so in addition to putting this capital budget together, uh, we have coordinated the multi-agency review of an average of approximately 140 projects per year using Maryland's growth and conservation criteria. Um, the reviews include screening for impacts to natural resource areas, proximity of projects to flood zones, the inclusion of uh, priority funding areas to help implement smart growth policy, um, and things like that. And uh, though we coordinate this process, it's really some of the other agencies like Department of Planning, um, an environment that are really looking at these criteria. So we thank them for their partnership we've had in this um, and look forward to continuing that. Thank that you, is Christine. all for the Department of, of Budget. You're welcome. Thank you, Christina. Uh, <laughs> the answer to a question uh, while we are uh, going to the next one is uh, we, the this is being recorded and we will be uh, posting the um, um, the, the full recording on the Maryland Department of Planning's website. So if you want to uh, catch up on any particular things, it will be there. And the next on our agenda is Commerce and Jim Palma from, uh, from Commerce is next. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jim Palma, Research Director for the Maryland Department of Commerce. And I'm standing in for Secretary Mike Gill who could not be with us today. One of Governor Hogan's top priorities when he took office was to improve the state's business climate and make Maryland a more welcoming and supportive place to launch, expand, or bring a business. This was a broad multi-agency effort that included reducing tolls and fees, making permitted processes either easier, and streamlining or eliminating hundreds of regulations. Promoting Maryland and our business-friendly attitude was the domain of Commerce's marketing team at the Maryland Marketing Partnership, a P3 established in 2016. The Open for Business marketing campaign they launched has included print and online ads, special magazine inserts, promotional videos, and a new website, open.maryland.gov. This campaign has reached 800 million business decision makers across the world, putting our state and what we have to offer in front of a lot of eyes. Commerce has also continued our efforts to attract new businesses to the state and help existing businesses grow and expand. Since 2015, we've supported 160 new business facility locations in Maryland, resulting in over 56,000 new and retained jobs. We've also launched new business incentive programs like the More Jobs for Marylanders tax credit, which supports new manufacturing jobs in the state. When the pandemic hit, Commerce got right to work standing up new business assistance programs, ultimately providing $430 million in emergency COVID-19 relief grants to businesses. Commerce is also home to the Maryland Office of Tourism, which had several great years during the Hogan administration. From 2015 through 2019, we saw visitor spending increase 10% to $18.6 billion. 
Although this industry was hit hard by the pandemic and recovery is ongoing, we did see strong growth and expect to see it again. We're also home to the Maryland State Arts Council, which provides funding to many artists and art organizations. MSAC grantees have averaged about $1.2 billion in annual economic activity and supported 14,600 jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Very much appreciated from Commerce. Um, the next um, agency on our list today is uh, Maryland Department of the Environment, uh, Les Snap. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Les Knapp, Senior Local Advisor in the Office of the Secretary at the Maryland Department of the Environment. And I want to highlight two critical smart growth accomplishments of the department under the Hogan administration. Both involve breaking down the more traditional siloed process to land use decision making and consider a more holistic and forward looking approach. The first is incorporating resilience concerns into land use decisions. Accounting for variables like climate change, flooding, sea level rise, saltwater intrusion, and others in growth decisions will ensure that the investments made by our state, local governments, businesses, and residents are protected for the long term. These concerns are now reflected in MDE's site-specific permitting decisions, the recent issuance of our phase one MS4 permits for stormwater runoff, consideration of county water and sewer plans, proposed stormwater regulatory changes under MDE's Advancing Stormwater Resiliency in Maryland, or A-STORM initiative, and Chesapeake Bay restoration efforts. The second accomplishment is incorporating environmental justice considerations into all major land use and environmental permitting decisions that come through MDE. Communities that are economically disadvantaged or have been subjected to past discriminatory practices often face additional challenges regarding land use decisions or the siting of facilities with negative environmental impacts. In response, MDE has created an online EJ screening tool that anyone can use to highlight what communities meet the economic or demographic EJ criteria, the location of facilities subject to environmental permits, and other key information like floodplain mapping. If you have a moment, I urge you to try this tool out. Uh, this tool will assist in making wise growth and environmental permitting decisions going forward. In conclusion, these two innovations will help keep Maryland as a national leader in both climate resilience and smart growth efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Les. Very good. Uh, just, just to clarify my other earlier, we will be posting uh, a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation along with a recording of the uh, presentation. So uh, uh, you could take notes, but we will post the, the, the PowerPoint as well. The next is the uh, Department of General Services. Wendy Scott Napier will provide a, uh, an update. Thank you, Wendy. Yes, good afternoon, Chuck. Um, happy to be here today. And it's it's so wonderful to hear all of our successful accomplishments throughout the state. Uh, just wanted to highlight four core areas here at, at DGS. Uh, we have, have had several very construction, very successful construction and renovation projects. Uh, these have included the Enoch Pratt Library in Baltimore City the Catonsville Courthouse, uh, the Lawyers Mall, and State House restoration efforts. Uh, we're very pleased with those projects. In our Office of Facilities Management, uh, we have implemented a new computerized maintenance management system, which helps us better track our buildings and predict maintenance problems even before they occur. Um, this is this tool is really going to help save state agencies money um, and help us better manage our facilities. And it is also being used as a model um, throughout Maryland and then also in other states throughout the country. 
our business enterprise administration um, has had a very successful last eight years. Uh, we have gone from donating a little over $100,000 uh, in federal surplus equipment to we are now up to $23 million um, in surplus federal supplies and equipment that we've been able to donate to needy families and communities throughout Maryland. Um, I know recently we did a very successful formula drive where we were able to obtain baby formula from the federal government and help distribute that to Marylanders. And as everyone knows, formula has been in short supply. So uh, we were really grateful that we could partner in that area. And finally, uh, a highlight in my own division, the Office of Real Estate. Um, as many agencies know, we initiated the State Center Relocation Project, uh, officially kicked the project off in 2021 to relocate 10 agencies and about 4,000 employees to new space in Baltimore's Central Business District. This is the largest relocation project we've ever undertaken in our history. Um, it's taken a lot of manpower and I'm uh, very grateful for our staff um, and all of the agencies that we've been working with um, that have provided support on the project. Uh, we have been able to achieve about a 25% space reduction uh, by using new space standards that we've in implemented and taking advantage of the hybrid telework model. And coincidentally, our move to Baltimore City is helping to absorb and reduce um, their vacancy rate, which is about 25% uh, spread across about 2 million square feet of office space. Uh, the state's going to be taking about half of that space and reducing the vacancy rate in the city to really help help Baltimore in the future. And those are my highlights for today. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, uh, Wendy, Scott Napier. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, uh, we appreciate all the, the, the great work and, and assistance the Department of General Services provides to the state agencies. It's, it's very much appreciated. Uh, again, thank you. Um, our next state agency is the Department of Health. Um, Atta Shrod, Shradi, I'm sorry, uh, is um, the next to speak. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Uh, I'm Atif Chaudhry, uh, Deputy Secretary of Operations for the Maryland Department of Health. Uh, happy to provide sort of a quick overview of some of the highlights uh, uh, when it comes to uh, coordination and smart growth for, for the health department. Uh, we have recently and in, in, in issued in September of 2021, uh, we developed and began already implementing uh, a 20-year facilities master plan for the department. Uh, the uh, MDH currently operates 11 uh, healthcare facilities located across the state, and this is a, a master plan sort of for um, realigning services over the next 20 years for the types of services we provide to the community. Um, so it's a really big deal. We haven't had a master plan in a long time. It does take into account um, the breadth of the entire state and ensuring that we're providing the right types of services in the right locations. Uh, we also implemented stormwater management and reforestation initiatives at various of, at our various facilities. Um, to really improve the the sites and um, ensure that we're uh, complying with a lot of uh, environmental concerns uh, located on on all our campuses and and to better the uh, state you know, as a whole. Uh, we have also implemented many uh, large scale energy performance con contracts at MDH facilities in partnership with the Department of General Services. Uh, and as part of all of these energy performance contracts that we that we have uh, implemented our facilities, uh, we were awarded the Maryland Green Registry State Energy uh, State Agency Energy Award uh, as being one of the most uh, energy efficient state agencies, um, uh, you know, uh, across the state. So we're very proud of that, and we're we're trying to ensure uh, as part of our master plan as well that we have really um, uh, high efficiency facilities that are being operated. Some of them are very uh, uh, are very old and we're trying to make them more modern, more efficient. 
Uh, and the uh, Wendy did mention this in her uh, in her briefing, but we M MDH is one of the uh, offices that will be consolidating and relocating to the Baltimore Central Business District. Uh, this allows MDH. Uh, we were such a large agency that we were spread across numerous sites. This allows us to to uh, consolidate offices and administrative into one administrative location, which makes it easier for the public to look to identify us and. For, and really revitalize the area that we'll be moving into. So we're very excited about that, to revitalize that area of Baltimore of the Central, ben uh, Central Business District. Uh, and I would be remiss if I did not mention our uh, the, the department's uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what Maryland was recognized as having one of the, the best uh, in the nation responses to the to the pandemic, uh, and I really wanted to thank from the bottom of my heart all of the men and women that have worked tirelessly um, over nearly the last three years on this effort. Uh, we are still um, still responding to the pandemic. It is flu season, and it is um, uh, you know we're, we are seeing an uptick in in COVID nineteen positivity rates and hospitalization. So we're still fighting this battle, and I really wanted to thank everyone for the hard work and dedication associated with this. Uh, it, it, it was uh, many, many people putting a lot of hard work, time, and energy and effort into this, and we really appreciate all that effort. Um, and uh, those are our big accomplishments, and I'm happy to answer any questions that we may have. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that, and we appreciate uh, the the service of our healthcare providers and, and healthcare uh, uh, assistance along the way. Uh, invaluable and particularly coming out of the COVID pandemic. So again, thank you to those folks. Uh, the next uh, agency is the Maryland's uh, Department of Housing and Community Development and Kevin Baines. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I, I skipped over um, the uh, labor first. Uh, I apologize, labor, uh, Jim, uh, Jim Ruskowski's Res next, I'm sorry. Actually, you went two slides over. I went two slides. I'm That's... sorry. I'm sorry. Kevin Baines is next. I, I'll I, yield I, to housing. Yeah, I, I apologize to both of you. Oh, uh, no Kevin. problem. Yes. Uh, hey, thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I just want to start off by saying the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development has been very productive under the Hogan administration. So I just want to give a big shout out to the administration for many of the things we could highlight. I have a handful here, but I just want to kick off with the first one and uh, say that over um, over the Hogan administration, we've financed and constructed more than 28,000 units of affordable multifamily housing. And uh, Quite frankly, that's using uh, you know federal low-income housing tax credits as well as state resources. But that investment actually exceeds over seven billion dollars. That's seven B. You know, with uh, with uh, you know that being a very very substantial investment um, in in that short period of time. And uh, on, on a similar note, uh, on on, uh, on what I'll call single-family uh, home ownership, we've actually grown to do more than four thousand mortgages a year. So over the entire uh, administration, we've actually done over 21,000 mortgages. And again, in terms of overall investment, that's another 5 billion with a B. So together, that's over like $12 billion of investment in affordable housing in, in the Hogan administration. So that I think that's very noteworthy and very substantial. I want to give those two a big shout out in the very beginning. Um, on, on, on a housing note, um, we've actually done a lot of work on homelessness. We've combined a number of uh, processes and procedures and actually put together a nice unit for homelessness. And quite frankly, we've reduced homelessness by the point in time count by 36% during the administration. That's also a very substantial uh, fact and figure to take home. 36% uh, decrease is huge. So I just want to give a shout out to, to that team as well. Um, something a little closer to my, my heart in the Neighborhood Revitalization Division, working with the City of Baltimore and the Maryland Stadium Authority, we've actually implemented Project Core under the Hogan administration. And, and together, we've eliminated more than 5,000 units of blight. That's not just um, demolition. Some of that was through stabilization, not just row homes. We've done schools, we've done warehouses, but all in all, over 5,000 units of blight have been eliminated. And again, that is a substantial accomplishment in the city of Baltimore. Um, that, that, that number is still increasing. So we're still working on it. We're not finished yet, and we're still chipping away at it, but so far over 5,000. And, uh, and, and as others have said, um, in response to the pandemic, uh, many businesses shuttered on Main Street, many businesses uh, closed. Uh, we're trying to bring those back. Um, so we've had two rounds of what we call uh, Project Restore, 
and uh, we have uh, invested over $48 million now in two rounds to over 700 businesses, 728 to be exact, to try to bring those back to the downtowns and main streets throughout the state. Um, you know, they're reopening, they're expanding, so we're doing everything we can to bring commerce back and businesses back to our historic downtowns. Um, so in the spirit of holiday season, shop Main Street, we're trying to bring those businesses back. And uh, and uh, happy holidays, everyone. And uh, thank you, Chuck and Wendy, for all, all you've done for us for the past administration. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, sorry about that. It just shows you I'm doing multiple clickings and things like this and never can tell what I'm gonna be clicking on next. So. Uh, you can always bear with me. So I appreciate that, Kevin. And now we'll try labor. Um, Jim. Good, good afternoon, Jim Repkowski, Assistant Secretary at the Maryland Department of Labor with the Division of Workforce Development uh, and Adult Learning. And I know the accomplishments are by the numbers and we have some very, very small numbers. However, I don't want those small numbers compared to the big fish in these presentations like housing and community development. Uh, the work that we are doing uh, is trans, uh, transformational. Uh, Governor, in 2019, fiscal year 2019, decided to really bring workforce to the table by using the Earn Maryland program to provide funding for workforce training for projects and residents uh, that live in, uh, in opportunity zones. One of the long-term criticisms uh, that has been around for a while is projects come into a community and the community does not have hands in actually working on those projects. And of course, uh, when a community and their members uh, actually build the projects and participate in those projects, those projects have even greater transformational impacts on the community and the residents that live in the community. I would give an example of Living Classrooms Foundation partnering closely with Southway Builders and Whiting Turner who are completing various projects in several Baltimore City Opportunity Zones. As part of their contracts, these employers uh, were required to hire 36% of their workers locally. This partnership has helped employers meet that hiring need while, ex while providing excellent training opportunities for Baltimore City residents. What is the impact? That impact is that individuals that live in the community are no longer just watching the projects being built. They're building them and participating in them with their own hands, with their minds, and which really gives a long-term investment uh, in those projects for the community to value. And of course, it improves the lives of those individuals because once an individual gets those workforce training skills, they can take them to several projects and jobs into the future. That's it. Thank you, Jim. Um, I always have difficulty to find my unmute button. Uh, again, thank you very much. And thank you for the folks at the Department of Labor. Next item is the Department of Natural Resources Assistant Secretary Phil Hager uh, is next. Thank you, Chuck. Um, greetings on behalf of Secretary Hadaway Riccio. She is in the field today in Cecil County. Um, I'm pleased to be uh, having an opportunity to highlight our accomplishments over the past uh, administration. And during the past eight years, through the efforts of Maryland Environmental Trust, the Rural Legacy Program, uh, DNR conservations and fee simple acquisitions, we have been able to preserve more than 73,000 acres of natural resource lands across our great state. Through our various programs, especially program Open Space Local, as well as community parks and playgrounds, we've been able to fund $343.5 million worth of public, uh, excuse me, of uh, parks and recreation enhancements for counties and municipalities throughout the state. Our Chesapeake and Coastal Bays Trust Fund has provided grant funds to our local partners, including NGOs, local governments, and others, to help meet our Chesapeake Bay restoration goals. Over the past eight years, this has amounted to more than $391 million. Additionally, we have funded $17.25 million of projects for, for climate resiliency, targeting vulnerable areas subjects to, subject to flooding, shoreline erosion and climate change. Working with our principal partners at MDE, MDA, MDOT and the Chesapeake Bay Trust, as well as many other local partners across the state, we've embarked upon an ambitious initiative to plant 5 million trees across our state by 2031. We've made great progress in year one, in spite of still being in a gearing up mode. 
DNR has also created several new tools for long range resource related planning, including CRAB, the Climate Ready Action Boundary, BUILD, which is a program for the beneficial use for, for dredge material, and the Climate and Health Equity Mapper, which is a mapping tool that is useful in helping us to locate new parks and also analyze many of the factors associated with climate change and health risks. Finally, we, just, uh, we are justifiably proud of the establishment of the Office of Outdoor Recreation. And I would like to thank our friends at Commerce for helping to make this, uh, new, this new initiative a, a reality. So um, it's been a phenomenal administration and DNR has been proud to, to contribute. Back to you, Chuck. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much. Uh, great work uh, at the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, our next agency is the um, Maryland Department of Transportation and Deputy Secretary Earl Lewis uh, is on, I believe. Yes, I am. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as an outspoken advocate for infrastructure, Governor Hogan has committed resources to improve the travel experience for our customers. MDOT actually has a long list of accomplishments over the past eight years, which makes narrowing the list extremely difficult, but here are four we'd like to highlight. The first is the Port of Baltimore expansion. The expansion of Maryland's Port of Baltimore is boosting jobs, revenue, and economic development, creating a second 50-foot deep berth at the Seagirt Marine Terminal in 2021 allows the port to accommodate two supersized cargo ships at the same time. The new berth and the addition of four environmentally friendly and electric powered Neo Panamax cranes are part of the $176 million investment from our public-private partnership with Ports America Chesapeake allows us to efficiently handle and move more cargo through our public terminal. This is paired with the expansion of the 46 million Baltimore Howard Street Tunnel Project, which will allow double stack container rail cars to travel to and from the port into the Midwest, while also allowing seamless double stack capacity up and down the East Coast for the first time. Once completed in 2025, the tunnel expansion will improve the supply chain and divert a portion of tractor trailer traffic off the I-95 corridor, reducing air pollution, highway wear and tear, and congestion. Second project is the Purple Line, light rail project. The Purple Line is another great example of a smart growth initiative under the Hogan administration. Work along the 16-mile rail line is underway and will connect people between Prince George's County and Montgomery County to commerce, education, and higher paying jobs. The Purple Line will also have 10 transit network connections that will provide direct access to Washington Metro, Mark, Amtrak, and the local bus services. The light rail's 21 stops will connect customers to hundreds of local businesses along the alignment. There are more than two dozen transit-oriented developments planned or under development along the Purple Line, creating more jobs, housing, and private investments. The third is customer service. Under Governor Hogan's leadership, MDOT is focused on providing premier customer service for all Marylanders. MDOT MVA's award-winning customer connect platform links driver and vehicle accounts in one place, providing more services online and a one-stop shop to access driver's license information, vehicle registration status, and much more. Nearly 850,000 Marylanders have signed up for a MyMVA account. You should too. During the pandemic, the Maryland Transportation Authority also made the switch to all electronic tolling years ahead of schedule. The switch allows traffic to keep moving through our toll facilities and decrease congestion and reduce emissions. The fourth is addressing climate change. MDOT continues to be a national leader in creating a sustainable transportation network aimed at addressing climate change and supporting Maryland's goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. At the end of November, we crossed a milestone of more than 60,000 registered EVs in Maryland. That's up two orders of magnitude over the past decade from 600. That number continues to grow exponentially, and MDOT is committed to expanding our EV charging infrastructure to meet the increasing demand. The collaborative Zero Emission Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Council Forum helps the public and private sector work together to accomplish Maryland's ZEV goals. The same goes for our Walktober initiative the Hogan administration launched in 2020 to raise awareness and improve bike ped safety and access across the state. Since launching registration for our annual Walktober walk in our series, we discussed safety, health, and facility needs for bike and pedestrian users increased 275% with more than 6,000 participants this year. So to close, MDOT has a countless number of accomplishments this past eight years under Governor Hogan's leadership, and we thank him for his vision as our infrastructure governor. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Lewis. Uh, yes, it, it, it is unfair to ask each agency to just uh, 
condense uh, eight years into one slide, and I appreciate everyone doing that. And uh, but I think our audience is getting a good flavor of the mixture of of activities that the uh, sub cabinet is addressing. So again, thank you so much. Our next um, um, agency is the Department of Higher Education, and Daniel Sh uh, Schuster is, is uh, going to highlight those items. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Schuster. I'm the uh, Capital Finance Analyst here at the Maryland Higher Education Commission, or MHEC. And today I'm going to be using our time to highlight a couple of very successful capital projects at some of the institutions. Uh, many people probably don't realize the magnitude of state dollars that are uh, spent on these types of projects. But over the past eight years of the Hogan administration, there was over $3.5 billion appropriated uh, toward capital projects at institutions of higher education. And uh, the current five-year capital improvement plan covering FY23 to 27 includes $2.3 billion for such projects. So it's a lot of money, and it's certainly important that if you're spending that kind of money, you want to do it in a responsible and sustainable way. And through the capital program review process and other requirements that we have in place, MHAC, along with all our partner agencies here, help to ensure that these projects all meet the SMART growth principles. And one such requirement is that all capital projects must meet high performance building standards uh, by attaining uh, the equivalent of lead silver or higher. And so we want to spend our time to highlight a couple of such buildings here today. The picture at the top there is of the Anne Arundel Community College Health and Life Sciences Building. This is a 175,000 square foot, three-story uh, state-of-the-art facility with 18 biology labs and 20 health sciences labs. And it allowed for the expansion of the college's nationally rated nursing program, which is particularly fitting considering construction of this facility occurred during the height of the pandemic when all of us were reminded of the importance of having a sufficient number of high quality nurses in each of our communities. And despite the pandemic, the construction remained mostly on schedule. It was completed in 2021 at the cost of about 117 million and it was certified LEED Gold. Uh, sustainable features of the building include that there's 1.3 acres of native landscaping, electric vehicle charging stations, low flow plumbing fixtures, and 25% of the building materials came from responsible sources, such as recycled and salvage materials. Then at the bottom there is a picture of the universities at Shady Grove Biomedical Sciences and Engineering Education Facility. This was completed in 2019 at the cost of approximately $162 million. It's a six level, 220,000 square foot building they includes 20 fully equipped teaching labs, two lecture halls, 20, or 12 active learning classrooms, along with some clinical training facilities. Um, at the outset of that project, everybody that was involved wanted to make this an example for sustainable design for teaching lab programs, both in the Mid-Atlantic region and globally. And certainly I think they were successful. This was certified LEED Platinum, which is the highest level you can get. Um, Sustainable features of the project include that 95% of the construction waste was recycled, 20% of the construction materials were locally sourced, 20% uh, of the building materials came from recycled content, and 100% of the water that falls on the roof is harvested and used for things such as uh, irrigation. Also, it was built on an existing parking lot in order to conserve green space. These are just two of many examples we could have come up with of sustainable projects uh, that occurred over the last eight years. And at MHEC, we're certainly very proud to showcase all of these projects. And we're looking forward to many more examples being completed in the years to come. So I thank everybody and thank you for your time. Thank you, Dan. Uh, excellent projects. Uh, very much appreciate it. Our, our, our next uh, agency is the uh, Maryland Environmental Agency and Director Maribeth Tung. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, glad to be here this afternoon. And I do want to thank everyone for um, 
the collegial working atmosphere we've had over the years, um, every single agency on here has um, worked in some form or fashion with my agency and uh, energy touches everybody. Everybody turns on electric switches and wants the lights to come on and that's our job to uh, help make sure that happens. To the extent we had a, um, a few uh, projects here, as you can see, um, that we've uh, concentrated on clean cars, energy efficiency. You don't have to, um, if you don't use the electrons, they don't need to be generated and that cuts down on pollution and um, costs and whatnot. Uh, resilience, in case there um, are, could be weather or whatever, um, we're able to bounce back. So our resilience um, definition is a little different than that of um, the Department of Environment, who tends to uh, think of trees and, and marshlands. And uh, that's their part of resilience. Ours is making sure that we can uh, withstand uh, disasters easily. Um, we started a multi-state, um, we, we signed onto a multi-state MOU called Smart Power, Southeast and Mid-Atlantic Regional Transformative Partnership for Offshore Wind. And uh, this started, we signed it in 2020 and that partnership is going strong and we've uh, gotten a lot of projects uh, underway on that. Um, regional, um, we get a little bit more um, umph on a regional basis and we would um, state by state. So this is with, um, this is MEA, Commerce and Labor, uh, we have worked together on this in the three states. It's uh, Virginia, uh, North Carolina and Maryland. Um, and last but not least, we have Somerset County Natural Gas Pipeline um, that serves uh, two major state institutions, a lot of private um, private areas too. So I want to go through each of these in a little bit more detail. Um, <clears throat> the clean car zero emission um, vehicles. Uh, this is the cars and the infrastructure. Uh, if you can, if you can't charge them, you must well not have them, right? So um, overall, the Hogan administration has invested approximately 23 million dollars in zero emission vehicles and infrastructure. So that helps uh, get to that 60,000 goal that um, the Deputy Secretary of Transportation um, just talked about. Uh, and this is, um, you know, statewide. Uh, we try to um, concentrate our efforts all over the place because everyone uh, in the state is important. Uh, Governor Hogan ensured that Maryland remains a leader in zero uh, emission vehicles or ZEVs by introducing and signing legislation, a lot of it, the Clean Cars Act of 2017, the Clean Cars Act of 2019, and the Clean Cars Act of 2020. And as a signatory to the medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicle MOU, um, uh, and the Department of the Environment is a, a big part of this as well. Uh, this is the MOU that establishes a target 100% of all new medium and heavy duty vehicle sales being ZEV by 2050. Uh, collectively, Maryland agencies have deployed over $20 million in state investments via tax credits and rebates to stimulate investment in electric cars and alternative fuel vehicles and infrastructure to support them. Uh, a lot of folks would be driving these cars um, if they could afford them. They are a little higher priced, so we're hoping that our incentives, and we've seen evidence that that's the case, that our incentives are helping to move that needle. Energy efficiency projects. Um, we have energy efficiency in, in a lot of different sectors. We have it in um, commercial, industrial, and agricultural. Uh, we're very proud of the moderate income, moderate and low income um, pro uh, projects. A lot of these we work through organizations, uh, local governments. Um, these are competitive awards. Um, the nonprofits and local governments know their citizens very well, know their needs much better than we do. So we find it easier to work through them. Um, and this resulted in upgrades in over 12,000 buildings and households that will benefit low and moderate income residents. And these projects could be um, you know, homeless shelters, women's shelters, as well as private homes. And there's a lot of energy poverty um, in Maryland. There's a lot of energy poverty in the country. Um, and this program, we hope, you know, it's lasting. Once you make uh, some upgrades, they stay. Um, the Department of uh, Housing and Community Development um, has had some part in uh, partnering with us as well. So this is a program we're very proud of. Um, and if you look at the state investment, 39.7 million, uh, we would have liked that to be uh, larger. Um, and we're working on that um, even as we speak of getting those investments even higher. Um, 
bolstering Maryland's uh, resilience to energy disruption, this is probably the biggest concentrations of new programs that we, we've done over, particularly over the last three to four years. Um, over $16.8 million have been invested. And again, the agencies, MEA, um, the department, uh, MDEP and um, PSC in particular, there's others, again, statewide impact. Um, it, this would have been probably more um, than 16.8 million, but these, as I said, were, um, were newer programs. State agencies, including um, MEA, MDEP, and the PSC actively are working to strengthen uh, Maryland's physical energy supply infrastructure. Um, Maryland's resilient um, program supports over 20 communities, businesses, and organizations to plan resilient power systems has funded the evaluation of over 30 potential sites for resiliency hubs in the city of Baltimore and continues to engage others for whom resilient energy supply is essential to health, well-being, and the economy. A lot of this actually started back uh, after Hurricane Sandy, uh, got a slow start, and we finally got our footing and, and got it going. Um, we continue to deploy combined heat and power systems in which generate power on site and use waste heat for building heating or air conditioning, and these systems can be 80 to 90% efficient uh, versus 30% uh, for standard generation. A lot of hospitals use this, hotels, 24 seven operations. Um, Montgomery County has put it in some of their um, buildings, their headquarters, and I believe the public safety building. Um, MEA has awarded nearly 14 million in grants to critical infrastructure businesses, multifamily properties, municipal governments, uh, industrial entities and other organizations across the state for the installation of combined heat and power systems that improve their efficiency, enhance sustainability, reduce energy costs, and bolster resilience to grid outages. This includes 16 complete systems, 27 under construction, including 11 hospitals, and unfortunately COVID um, slowdowns uh, affected this program quite a bit, but they're, um, they're going strong now, so hopefully we'll get those completed sooner than later. Uh, MEA was also the lead agency that responded to the Colonial Pipeline incident in 2021 and is leading an update uh, to the state's uh, liquid fuel plan. And we were recognized, actually, the picture here, um, CESA is, oh, geez, I can't remember, solar. Um, can't remember uh, the acronym right offhand. But anyway, this is a national recognition for resiliency and resiliency hub recognition. And resiliency hubs are in low income areas and these hubs are um, provide power in the case of a power outage, uh, provide shelter for residents in those communities. Uh, this is a pro project that can cost a lot just to scope it out and figure out what you need to build. So we help provide funding for that as well uh, and get those folks over the hump that they need to get to to, to get these resiliency hubs built. A lot of these are, um, built with um, nonprofits in the community. And somebody had mentioned earlier the Living Classrooms Organization and uh, Power 52 uh, has partnered with them for at least one of the resiliency hubs that we've helped with. Um, as I said, the Smart Power uh, MOU, uh, this was in October of 2020. Um, there's a lot of time and effort has been put into this, some money, uh, but a lot of it's just a collaboration and part of MEA's um, role to try to bring people together. Um, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, as I said before, have developed a partnership uh, via the Smart Power MOU to leverage each state's collective assets to engage the growing offshore wind um, and supply chain, which may support approximately 86,000 jobs in the region, 57 billion in investment, and 25 billion in economic output for the three states. This regional effort will cooperatively advance the deployment of offshore wind projects by reducing, where appropriate, administrative burdens related to state regulatory requirements, identify, evaluate, and promote qualified workforce, research universities, and training programs, and share information and best practices related to regulatory processes. And they are different in the various states. It's, it's kind of amazing. Uh, military compatibility, environmental and natural resource protection, which is a big one that we can do in a, a, as a regional um, effort, workforce training, public engagement, competing uses, and stakeholder interests. And I will say that um, Baltimore in March will be the site of uh, International Partnership Forum, which is a large um, gathering of offshore wind folks. And so if you're not familiar with that, let us know and we'll uh, direct you there. But we are uh, a major sponsor for that uh, forum in March of this year. So 
Um, Somerset County uh, natural pipe gas pipeline, this is probably the one uh, more um, contentious uh, issue um, that we, we've done, but it's, it's very, very important. Um, $2.8 million uh, in state investment as well as time and effort. And uh, I was on an offshore wind trip at one point um, in, in Europe and, uh, and I was getting a call at midnight, it was five o'clock our time here, um, trying to get this, this worked out. Um, so there's been a lot of time and effort put into this. Um, Somerset County was very, very active, uh, Board of Public Works, uh, um, the Public Service Commission, uh, University, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, um, the uh, ECI prison, there, there's a lot of entities is, was working on this. The Maryland Energy Administration provided grant funding, expertise, encouragement, and coordination to a multi-departmental effort to retrofit two important state facilities from badly dated assets fired by dirtier energy commodities to new clean and affordable natural gas fired assets. The University of Maryland Eastern Shore is presently served by, was presently, or was served by uh, heating oil number two and number six. And uh, the president um, came to me at one point, and she said, I couldn't believe when I moved here and it was, you know, heating oil. Um, she wanted a much cleaner campus and she got it. Uh, the Eastern Correctional Institute uh, is presently served by debarked wood chips and we're in the process of installing that system um, at this point, the new system. Um, all commodities are presently delivered uh, via diesel trucks. Uh, this project will allow UMES to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions by 38%, cut their, cut their energy costs in half. Um, ECI currently burns 50,000 tons of wood chips and converting to natural gas will reduce their carbon dioxide emissions by 65% and particulate emissions by 99%. A new, new distribution pipeline from the Salisbury area has been constructed constructed and pressurized and supplies are cleaner and more affordable energy to UMES and will soon supply ECI and um, everything in between. Uh, there's uh, chicken integrators and, and whatnot that are also hooking in residents, uh, communities. Uh, this will lower the energy commodity costs and increase the energy resiliency and reliability of both institutions and as I said, for other folks in the community. And the project will bring much needed economic development to Somerset County and Princess Anne, Maryland. So I think that um, kind of covers uh, some of our the highlights. And again, it's been an honor and a privilege working with everyone uh, on these projects and other projects that MEA has been involved with. So thank you very much, Chuck and uh, Secretary Peters uh, for allowing us to uh, discuss all of our accomplishments the last uh, eight years. Thank you, Director Tung. Uh, exceptional uh, list of, of accomplishments. Again, thank you so much. Um, our, our final agency um, is the State Department of Assessments and Taxation, uh, Director Higgs. Yes, thank you very much for uh, having us here today. ASTAT is uh, very proud of its accomplishments over the past eight years and happy to share some of those with you guys today. Um, in all of calendar year 2014, ESTAD approved 8,600 online submitted LLC formation filings, which is the most popular type among ESTAD's customers. Because of our online expansion, enhancement and promotion of ESTAD's award-winning Maryland Business Express online filing platform of the last eight years, the vast majority of business filings are now submitted and paid for online, guaranteeing ease of customer and staff tracking and maximizing an efficient review process. As such, in calendar year 21, ESTAD approved 8, 000, or 80, over 85,000 online submitted LLC formation filings, almost a 900% increase over the last eight years. ESTAD's robust online resources have eliminated the need to travel to State Center to make necessary business transactions. The ESTAD assessment offices have valued over 775,000 properties each year for the triennial assessment while keeping key metrics within industry standards. The Real Property Division added an impressive 77,307 taxable accounts during the years of the current administration, processed over 550,000 property owner transfers and over 200,000 assessment appeals. Approximately one third of all first level appeals receive a reduction in value owing to the care and attention paid to our customers' concerns. The ESTAT Real Property Data Search is the number two most visited Maryland government website and we provide for free the invaluable information that most other states and jurisdictions charge for. 
When COVID hit, SDAT's Office of Information Technology was prepared for the emergency, deploying over 500 pieces of equipment to staff to assist in their telework after the March 2020 shutdowns. The team was also able to scan or import over 500,000 new documents into its document management system, reducing paper and increasing visibility and access to these documents electronically via our website, and assigned 79 Adobe Acrobat uh, and Adobe Sign licenses for staff to create, view, edit, and sign documents electronically so that we could continue administering top-notch customer service during the pandemic. And our last point, SDAT conceptualized, launched, developed, and continues to grow its customer service contact center into a team that consistently delivers upon and champions the department's customer service promise and stands as a customer service model for other units across the department and the state. Our average wait time from FY 21 to FY 22 was reduced by 15 minutes. Additionally, we were able to answer 96% of our calls versus 49% in the previous year, and our call abandonment rate decreased from 20% to just one and a quarter percent. SDAT's digitization efforts are paying huge dividends in customer satisfaction, with our online charter services receiving satisfaction rates of over 96%. With SDAT's transformation over these past eight years, we're incredibly pr proud of the role that we played in making Maryland open for business. Thanks a lot for having us today. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Director Higgs. Um, at, at this particular point, uh, I'm gonna go through some questions uh, that we've received. Um, and if, if we don't have a great answer for you or, or, or on a, a specific uh, answer to your question, uh, I will follow up to the individual asker uh, to see if I can get information. Some of these re uh, inquiries may require a little bit more research on our part, uh, but I will borrow, I will uh, collaborate and, and coordinate with the different state agencies. Our first question, um, and, and there's a couple of questions related to this, uh, it, does the uh, does Maryland study the impact of rubble landfills uh, on local property values? And how does that affect county state property assessment? Um, I, I don't know, it, uh, Director uh, Higgs, uh, since you talk about property assessment, I don't know if you have any insight on that, um, that aspect of that, that, that question. I'm sorry, can you give me the, uh, just in a, in a brief uh, bullet point one more time? Sure. The question is, does the, uh, and I'll try to answer the first part. The, the, the first part of the question is, does the Maryland uh, study the impact of rubble landfills on local property values? Uh, and, and my answer is, I don't know right now, and I will look into that and get back to the person. And the fa second part of the question is, is, how does the effect of rubble landfills affect uh, state property assessments? Sure. Well, I mean, it's one of the factors to consider among uh, among everything that impacts market valuation. So, uh, to to the extent that that uh, a landfill or or some public project uh, has a has a negative impact on on uh, on local sales, then that's going to uh, affect assessments. Because what we do is we take a snapshot of the market value. So it really depends on on comparable sales, and and we're going to uh, you know be a, a lagging indicator on a project like that. Uh, because once it starts uh, affecting property sales, then that's when when uh, it's going to start to uh, to hit our numbers on the assessment side. Thank you very much, Director Higgs. Um, Les uh, Knapp, uh, I don't know if you have any um, in input or in insight regarding this. Again, we'll coordinate a response. Uh, does M M MDE have any, uh, are you aware of any studies dealing with the impact of rubble landfills? I am not aware of the moment of those studies. I know MDE certainly as a permitted agency of those landfills tries to carefully consider the impacts on, on a site-by-site -site basis. Uh, and obviously we, we do not get into adjoining, the valuation of adjoining properties. Thank you, Les. Uh, again, I will follow up uh, with uh, uh, Director Higgs and uh, Les if there's any other information they have regarding, there's another question about uh, landfill initiatives as well. So um, as I said earlier, we will we are going to uh, uh, post the recording of today's uh, webinar uh, public forum um, and the, um, the PowerPoint slides will be posted. 
Another question is, uh, and I think uh, this is to uh, Wendy Scott Napier, does the building maintenance software include green infrastructure around those assets to support green and uh, gray life cycle asset management? I think that was a question related to your some of your um, presentation, Wendy. Hi, Chuck. You, yes. Um, so I know on a very basic level that we are looking at different aspects of our maintenance of facilities. I know we have different systems in place to monitor, for example, HVAC equipment and really assess things before they are going past their useful life. So that's the level of my understanding at this point, but I would be happy to take this question back and, and get a response and get more information. Great, thank you. And there's one more question for you. Uh, uh, Wendy, um, can you pro uh, and again, uh, you can either give it over the phone uh, or uh, over the uh, at this point. But uh, there was a question: Can you uh, post the uh, point of contact information, name, number, and email address for DGSS uh, regarding your uh, federal supply property equipment uh, for schools uh, in need of laptops and computers? Yes, I will do that. I will post that in the chat. Great, great. And again, we'll follow up and, and include uh, any information to this specific person. Um, and and I'll, I'll coordinate that with Wendy. Next question. Uh, this may be also for you, Wendy. Uh, what cloud-based services are you using to support green? Uh, well, actually, this probably will be more or less. So if you have anything, Wendy, but uh, what cloud-based services are you using to support the green stormwater infrastructure life cycle planning? I don't know if you know anything about that, Wendy. I think I will pass that question over to Les, Chuck. Les, uh, anything from the MDEs on the stormwater management of uh, any insights on uh, the stormwater infrastructure life cycle planning? So broadly, I think that's something MDE is is working on through our ASTARM initiative, uh, revisiting stormwater requirements in, in terms of quantity management, quality management, uh, and, and also just updating the basic data that we have as flooding and precipitation patterns change. So I, I would say, say stay tuned this upcoming year and the next couple of years as those changes are made, that will then set the stage for infrastructure changes. Thank you, Les. We'll, uh, again, I'll follow up more specifically with the asker of that question and, and connect uh, with Les with that person too. Uh, we have one question about uh, environmental disclosures expected uh, of real estate developers uh, in the state of Maryland. Uh, D Director Higgs, I don't know if you know anything about this. This is more of a legal question, probably. Uh, we have at the Department of Planning some technical assistance on brownfields. Uh, I will uh, share this question with our uh, Resource Conservation and Management Unit to see if they can provide some assistance to this asker. But the question is, what does environmental disclosures are, what environmental disclosure expected uh, of real estate developers in the state of Maryland. Uh, Director Higgs, do you have any insight on that at all? Uh, there are regulations uh, in this regard that uh, that require certain um, certain information to be uh, to be conveyed, but I, I don't have uh, the details uh, on, on that uh, for for the for this forum. Sorry. Okay. Thank you so much. And again, I will uh, follow up with our folks, and we may uh, we'll touch base with you to, on our response back. Um, one of our last questions, is there a list of parks that received the enhancements in Prince George's County? Um, I'm not exactly sure which enhancements uh, were for, but uh, uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Phil Hager, uh, do you have any, any insights on that? Or maybe, again, I can uh, coordinate a response back to this inquirer. Chuck, if you could do that, that would be really helpful. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I could try to guess on what they might mean by enhancements, but I, I have I, I'm not at all clear what that question means. And okay. uh, what we'll, we'll we'll definitely get uh, a response. I I will coordinate to try to get a little bit clarity on the question as well as try to get a good uh, uh, final response back to them. Um, 
Uh, next question is, what is the breakdown of these accomplishments inside and outside the PFA? Um, good question. Uh, the, the, uh, the state of Maryland does report on um, expenditures for state, uh, for certain state projects uh, that uh, induce growth, growth uh, related projects. And uh, it's, uh, we published the report, the report, uh, the, the, the FY22 report is currently being finalized and reviewed uh, and will be published shortly. The FY21 and 20 and, and, and the other reports are on the Maryland Department of Planning's uh, website under the uh, our accomplishments, I believe it is. Um, and uh, maybe John can actually lit, uh, put the uh, point, but it's in our, our, in our library that we post online and you can get a reporting of the projects by agencies and by the uh, dollar amounts for inside and outside the PFA, but those are the only ones that that are uh, tracked to that level. So the, the the accomplishment, many of the accomplishments that are reported today are statewide and may not always directly relate themselves to a specific uh, uh, location. Um, all the data stats have been uh, based upon information from 2016. Uh, uh, how was the data gathered on homeless? Uh, uh, Kevin Baines, could you get some information and response on the how the data was gathered on homelessness and uh, the same regards to the vacancy housing? Sure. Well, specifically, I'd like to follow up with Stuart Campbell, who who is in fact very knowledgeable on the homeless uh, statistics and how they're they're uh, you know calculated. So, I, Chuck, I'll gladly follow up with Stuart on on the exact calculation. Yeah, in terms of vacant housing, Chuck, what, what's the exact question? The que well, and I'll forward the que exact. Uh, I'll forward the askers email, and we'll coordinate on this. And they're asking about uh, uh, the collection of data dealing with homelessness and how they okay. were counted. Okay, absolutely. So I think we can get an answer to that. Time, it's the point in time count method, and Stuart and Danielle can certainly speak eloquently on all the all the specifics. Okay. Um, the uh, question is, can we put uh, the website where we can find all the info uh, in, in the near future? Uh, again, uh, the uh, website is the planning.maryland.gov uh, will be the website and it'll be under the planning coordination uh, sub tab. And again, uh, if uh, uh, John could put that under where that will be, we currently have posted the last uh, uh, public form, and we'll replace the last form with this form. And again, I said we'll also put the uh, uh, the PDF of today's report. Um, um, question is, what has been an accomplishment in the last eight years to keep local and county governments accountable in their adherence to smart growth principles as the state makes significant investments in such areas? Um, and again, I, I would say uh, just as this, and, and I'll, I'll um, I, I don't know if I, uh, MDOT is actually one of the most significant of the, the PFA tracking ones, but our PF, the PFA law has been actually a, a significant uh, guider uh, of growth uh, inside. And, and uh, we, we do monitor the number of new units on an annual basis inside and outside. And we are achieving above the our goal of 75% uh, of our new units uh, are inside the PFA and 25% of the new units are outside. Um, and so that a lot of the state spending is really geared towards supporting local governments as they also are partners with us in um, uh, achieving uh, smart growth in those areas. Um, and I think uh, Wendy has posted the connect the data regarding the federal program uh, as well. So, uh, uh, John, if you could just post that to the webs uh, to the uh, everyone, I think that would be great. That was the last uh, the last comment or question that I have on my list, um, and. Uh, 
This uh, is also the forum for any public comments. We've, ans we've answered a lot of questions. Uh, I'm gonna just give a, another couple of seconds for folks that have had any kind of other questions for uh, the agencies uh, related to local government's uh, efforts um, and smart growth. I want to express it, uh, the appreciation for our virtual audience, and I want to express my deep uh, appreciation to our state agencies uh, that have uh, uh, helped in putting together this particular um, presentation, but by working with the Department of Planning over the past eight years, and we appreciate their uh, collaboration and, and, and cooperation. Um, not seeing any additional comments at this particular time. Uh, we are going to thank everyone that participated in today's uh, virtual public forum. And uh, we want to wish everyone a happy holidays coming up. Uh, on behalf of Special Secretary Peters, uh, again, thank you so much for your attention today and appreciate all of the work that everyone in the agencies and our local government partners who have been doing and working with us. So again, thank you so much and have a great day.